welcome. Whether you're a regular attender at OBC, whether you're just joining us for the first time, or somewhere in between, we're excited to have you with us. And if you aren't already in touch with us, we would love to get to know you. You'll find our contact details at the end of the service. My name is Jenny and I'll be guiding you through the service. Today we're blessed to have Graham Dunn sharing a message with us about faith as we work our way through the book of Luke. And today's talk is based on Luke chapter 7 verses 1 to 10. I'm doubly blessed to have had the support of my wonderful life group in preparing for this service. And during the course of it you will meet them as they provide the prayers and the reading. It's been quite a week, as the world has been shaken by protests in the wake of the shocking death of your George Ford in the States. Black Lives Matter isn't a statement, a slogan or a movement. It's a truth, and it's all the more shocking because it has to be said at all. As a white woman, I'm aware that I'm not really qualified to comment on this, but I can't leave it unsaid. Paul says in Galatians 3, 26-28, that we're all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ, for all who are baptised into Christ and have clothed themselves in Christ. There's no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. He could equally have added black nor white to the list. Human beings in all our glorious diversity of skin colour and body shape and gender and character and interests and quirks and gifts and talents are each handcrafted by our maker in his image and likeness. We are all uniquely special in his eyes. Only in embracing the richness of our differences can we begin to glimpse his greatness and glory that encompasses it all and more. If we truly saw Jesus looking out through each other's eyes, not only wouldn't we dare look down on others and treat them poorly because they're not the same as us, it just wouldn't occur to us to do so. This is one small part of what we yearn for when we pray those familiar words, your kingdom come. In God's kingdom there is neither black nor white, foreigner nor native, no British, no European, no African, no Asian, no American, no stranger. We are all equal in his sight and it should not need to be said that black lives matter. But apparently it does. So let's stand together and say it loudly. But when the news cycle moves on, Let's make sure we don't just say it. Let's live it. God's kingdom come. As our country takes its first shaky tentative baby steps out of lockdown, I'm reminded again of the need for an eternal perspective. These past few months have seemed so long, but what will they look like in a year or two, over a lifetime? What do they look like against God's eternity? Frustrating as it may have been, this time is also very precious. Whether you've been working throughout or forced into isolation, whether you've been able to spend more time with loved ones or been able, unable to see them, forced to spend more time than you like with someone, or thrust into isolation. There can't be many of us who haven't at some point been driven to consider what's really important in life. What do we really value and why? What are we missing? What have we appreciated? For myself, whatever the stresses and strains, and there have certainly been some, being able to spend more time with my family has been a real gift. For our life group too, it's been a chance to evaluate what really matters. For anyone who doesn't know, our life groups are small groups who meet weekly, usually in someone's house. In many churches they're called home groups or house groups or small groups. I love the name life groups. Because these groups are about sharing life together. They're life shaping, life giving, life affirming and all about bringing our faith to bear in our day to day lives. We usually meet every Wednesday, and while our evenings always begin with fellowship and prayer, the focus is usually a study of some kind. We've continued to meet every week over Skype since the first week of lockdown, but with the new pressures that the medium puts on us, we've discovered that what really matters is sharing our news, our thoughts, our highs and lows, praying for and with each other, as well as for our community and our world. Prayer has at last become the very heart of what we do, and I'm amazed by how the group members have grown in confidence as we pray together. This is a gift that God has given us during this challenging time that will sustain and strengthen us long after lockdown ends and we're able to meet in person again. As Graham talks to us today about faith, I find myself frequently awed and humbled by the depth of everyday honest faith 
with all its doubting, stumbling and questioning, but following anyway, that I find in the members of my group, and how that in turn strengthens my own faith. The group agreed to invite you all to join our prayers last Wednesday evening by recording those prayers for this morning's service during our Skype meeting. Martin and Andy have chosen the songs this morning, and Peter and Chris bring us the reading. A real team effort. Welcome to our life group. We invite you to join us in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come together in fellowship in your name, to share our lives together and join our voices in prayer. You promise that whenever two or three gather together in your name, you are there. Lord of space and time, be with us tonight, with those in our group who cannot be here, and with all who join us in the online service. We pray for those who lead us in the church, in our workplaces, in our community, and in our country. Give them wisdom, strength, courage, and vision at this challenging time to lead us with honesty and purpose in the ways you've set before us. Give us the grace to love and support them in their task as we rem remember that they are your children first and leaders second. Amen. 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 Lord, we pray for those who are worried about losing their jobs, who have no financial security, who are worried about how to provide the basics for themselves, their families, their young children. Just things like food, shelter, clothing, the practicalities, the basics of life. Lord, we pray that you would be with them and support them. We pray as well that those that are job hunting will be able to find ways of doing that in this new normal we find ourselves in. And Lord, we thank you for organisations across the country who are helping to support people in practical ways. And at this time, Lord, we would particularly want to pray for food banks and organisations like CAP. Lord, just help them to cope with the demands that are being made on their services and their time. Give them your strength and your love to reach out to others in need. Amen. Amen. Lord, I pray for children not able to go to school, who miss their friends and who are missing out on an increasingly larger chunk of our education. I pray for the different areas where somewhere some of which this is worse some which is other and as always worse in the more deprived areas lord be with those children amen amen i'd like to pray for those who are struggling with their mental health people who are overwhelmed find themselves crying for no reason at all and suddenly everything becomes too much for them. And I ask that you'll come alongside them. Not just you, but you'll surprise them by their own, their own little miracles. Because quite often with miracles, it's, it's the timing as well. And I ask that you'll prompt people to come alongside them and to encourage them. Perhaps send a card or give them a phone call or give them a video call. And I ask that you'll make them strong as they go through this difficult time. Please, please, Father, be gracious to them. Amen. Amen. Lord, love, put your loving arms around those who are ill or suffering because of loss. Make it as Jesus did. He drew out his hands, hands and touched the blind, the lame thing. Please let them know your comfort and your word. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, our hearts join yours 
as we watch the suffering and grief of families throughout the world, especially those with young children living in poverty and hunger and disease because of the current closure of all voluntary support. We pray, Lord, that it will be soon that they are able to be safely restored with groups who are able to inject them against many childhood diseases, that the vaccinations that are needed will be available and people able to give it to them again to stop the spread of so many diseases already in our world. I think especially in places like Ethiopia, where there are at least three other diseases rampant at the moment. Lord, keep safe those who may still be able to serve you in such organisations. And as they try to give hope, we ask that you'll keep them safe as they help families again to be able to receive all the help that they need. We pray for each organisation and we ask especially that governments and the World Health Organisation will work together to eradicate all disease as you would have done in the time that you were here on earth. Lord, bless them all in your name. Amen. Amen. Father God, you created all things. You created each person and you love each person without boundaries. Father, give us your heart. Help us to love the way that you love each and every one, our neighbours, our colleagues, our schoolmates and all those on our front line, that we can show them your love for us and we can do that in what we do, what we say and how we act. Amen. 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 Yes, Father, you have created us in your image and lavished your love, your infinite love on each and every one of us, redeeming us through your son, Jesus. Father, we look to you. Give us vision. Give us wisdom. Give us compassion to see things the way you do. Weed out any hint of prejudice in my heart, Lord, and by your spirit, help me to see others as you see them. Give me courage to stand firm and put an end to any form of racism or discrimination so that we may live peacefully alongside all our brothers and sisters. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. 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 And Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are grieving at this time, <clears throat> especially those separated from their loved ones due to the lockdown restrictions and are feeling alone and isolated in their grief. Lord, would you draw especially close to them? Would you comfort them and be their strength? And where, even after so many weeks, there is no sense of normality returning, which would help them begin the process of moving forward. Lord, would you give them a hope for the future and bring them your peace into their lives? We lift these prayers to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us in our prayers. We're now going into a time of worship. Chain will break his broken heart. 
hearts declare His praise. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? from Luke chapter 7 verses 1 to 10 the faith of the centurion when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening he entered Capernaum there a centurion's servant whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die the centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him asking him to come and heal his servant when they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. 
When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Well, hello. It's um, good for you to uh, have invited me to speak to you again, and it's a real privilege to be able to do so and to speak to you in your own homes. Today, we're going to be looking together at Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 10, as we continue our journey through the Gospel of Luke. Um, now, as we do this and as we go into the Gospel, um, I think it's important for me to remind you that Luke never attempted a strict chronological order to his gospel. Um, the gospel is written with an eye to using the events of Jesus' life to illuminate different aspects of what is taking place. And that's one of the things that I really like about the different gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They're all looking at the same event, the same situation, but for, through a different camera lens and from a different angle, a different camera angle. And when we put of all of that together, we get a very rich, multi-dimensional understanding of what was taking place. And it's uh, very, very informative. And today we are looking in Luke's gospel at the healing of the centurion's servant, Luke 7, 1 to 10. And this follows directly on from the teaching of Jesus about the wise and foolish builders. And I think Luke chose to put it there deliberately. Let me Remind you how Jesus finishes that teaching, uh, Luke 6, verse 49. The one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Well, I think it's deliberate that this is there. And um, let's take a look at um, what happened with the healing of the centurion's servant. At its simplest level, this is about a man, the centurion, who is deeply hurting because a servant who he loves is ill to the point of death. And in, pain, in faith, the centurion takes his own pain to Jesus um, to ask for a healing. And uh, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert now. Sorry about this. The servant is also healed. And it's a story, I believe, that can speak into our lives today. Now, when I was beginning to prepare this sermon, I had a bit of a mishap. And, and I think this mishap was a, a sort of has enabled me to speak into um, this, this particular passage. My son had bought a bike, uh, but he had a problem with this bike. The, the saddle post didn't quite fit properly into the frame of the bike and no matter how tight he tightened up the the bolt as he rode along the saddle would just slowly slip further and further down and so my son came to me and he said dad what can I do to fix this well I I knew what to do and I, I said to my son come with me I think we can fix this quite easily and I took a can of beer I pulled the beer out and then I got some scissors and I cut a rectangle out of the can of the the metal form that into a tube, put that tube into the frame of the bike, then put the seat post in, tighten it up, hey presto, absolutely perfect, the seat post does not go up and down. And possibly for the first time in about 25 years, my son looked at me with respect because of my technical abilities. But there was a bit of a problem. And uh, if you're ever going to try this at home, what I want to tell you to do is beware. Because whilst it is possible to cut a can with a pair of scissors because the, the metal is so thin, what it does do is leave a razor sharp edge to it. And as I was trying to fix the bike and fix the seat post, I got a nick in my thumb. Now, this was one of those horrible little nicks. You know, it's not deep enough for stitches or anything like that, but it jolly well hurts and it took a long time to heal. And as I was preparing this sermon over the days, the, the, the little pain of that thumb was constantly there. And even now, uh, over a week later, I can still feel it if I just press it 
press it in. Now, what I'm not looking for here is your sympathy. There's lots of other people who need your sympathy a lot more than I do. But what I want to share with you is that as I felt my thumb hurting, I was nudged by God, I feel, to think about the other areas of my life where there is hurt. And as I was reflecting on that, I realised there's quite a lot of hurt that I carry around with me. And as I was preparing this sermon, I realised that amongst my friends at Oaken Baptist Church, amongst you dear people watching this at home, there's going to be quite a lot of hurt. Maybe not everybody's got it, but there's going to be a significant amount of hurt. And it's something that we all have in common. We're hurting in different ways. And so I wonder, what is your hurt? Where is your hurt? And I'm not talking about a cut thumb or finger. What I'm talking about is the pain of the person who you might have deeply loved and cared about, but who betrayed you. You now live with the pain of hurt and a broken relationship. I'm talking about the pain maybe of injustice. I'm talking about the pain that you might have caused yourself or other people by making wrong choices or taking bad decisions. I'm talking about the pain of worrying about family, friends and relatives. Of waking in the middle of the night with that anxiety as you worry about them. I'm talking about the pain of regrets. I should have done this or I should have done that. I'm talking about the pain of fear, the fear of COVID or the fear of the end of lockdown or the fear of continuing lockdown, fear of returning to school or work or maybe even the fear of redundancy. I'm talking about the pain of loneliness, loss or bereavement. I'm talking about the pain of addiction or the pain of mental and physical poor health. I'm talking about the pain of knowing that you're not what you present to the world and the pain of knowing how exhausting that can be. And so as, as I was preparing this talk, that tiny painful little cut on my thumb opened my eyes to the pain that is all around and I confess is in me in different ways. And I just wonder, does this resonate with you? Or are you just watching me and thinking, oh, thank goodness I don't have the pain that Graham has? I doubt it. I think we're all hurting in different ways to different levels. Well, I've got some good news for you. God walks with us in our pain and he's ready to deal with it when we are. So let's go to the story of the centurion and discover how we might bring our faith, uh, our, sorry, our pain to Jesus. So let's take a look. What do we know about the centurion? Well, he was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. And in the sort of, in that um, culture of the time, he was an outsider of the Jewish faith. But he was sympathetic to the Jewish cause and a benefactor of the local synagogue. He was respected by the Jewish leaders. His love and concern for his servant reveals a kind character. He was a man of authority, used to giving orders and receiving them. And his servant was seriously ill. And so he hears of Jesus and he sends Jewish elders to ask Jesus to come. And the Jewish elders, we are told by Luke, respectfully come to Jesus and plead earnestly with him. This man deserves your help. He's a good man. He has rebuilt our, our synagogue. He is, uh, he is a, a supporter of our nation. Well, let's take a little look at that. They told Jesus he deserves your help because of what he has done. Their message is he has earned the right to be helped. Now that echoes the way that the Jewish faith was being taught at the time. You earn God's favour through your own efforts. But we know that Jesus came with a message that was different to that. The message of Jesus challenges is that through, through his teaching, through his life, through his example, through his death and resurrection. Jesus taught that you come into relationship with God by receiving God's gift of grace. And then you respond to that 
with the living worship of a transformed life. But Jesus agrees to go with them. I assume he already knows the humble heart of the centurion, which has been misrepresented by the embellishments of the Jewish elders. But on the way to the centurion, they are met by other friends of the centurion with a message that is totally different to the message given by the elders. Now, I am supposing here that these other friends that we meet in this um, in the uh, narrative here were possibly soldiers who understood the importance of giving accurate messages word for word. So let's look at that word for word. Jesus is addressed as Lord, a term of honour, respect and recognition of who Jesus was. And he's told, do not trouble yourself. I do not deserve for you to come under my roof. I am not worthy to come before you. I recognise my sin and failings. How could such a man as I stand before a man such as you, is what the centurion is saying, let alone invite you to come into my house. There is deep humility in this and a deep recognition of sin. But he goes on. But say the word and my servant will be heard, healed. A word from you is enough. The centurion has complete faith in Jesus. He's not asking for anything ritualistic or elaborate. He just has deep faith and he recognises that a word is enough. And then to go on and paraphrase verse 8. He is told that I recognise you as a man of authority. So here is a man, the centurion, who knows exactly what authority is. He knows how it works. He sits under the authority of a commanding officer. He sits under the command, or the, the chain of command that takes you right up to Caesar himself. And he also has authority in his own men. But this man, this centurion, recognises an authority greater than all of that in Jesus. And this man, the centurion, identifies with Jesus as a man of authority. Your authority, Jesus, is so great. A word from you is enough. Well, I look at this as the parable of the wise and foolish builder in action. The centurion has deep foundations of faith that is so clear to see. And Jesus responds. Verse 9. I tell you I have not found such great faith even in Israel. A big challenge that would have been to the Jewish elders who are listening in. Here is a Gentile Roman soldier with greater faith than them. And we know and we read on the servant was immediately healed. So what has all of this got to say to us, to people who are hurting in the middle of a Covid crisis? Well the message here is bring your brokenness and your pain to Jesus. We are not designed by our maker to have knotted stomachs filled with anxiety. We are not designed to wake in the night fretting about stuff. We're not designed to carry the burden of addictions and other stuff. We're not designed to carry unforgiveness of people who have hurt and damaged us. We're not designed to be paralysed by fear of the unknown, whether that is a Covid virus or a difficult social or work situation. Bring your brokenness and pain to Jesus. Not because you have earned a right to do it, but because Jesus invites you to do it. Come to him. But how? How do you approach the creator of the universe with your pain? Well, this passage tells us. First, come in faith. Second, come in humility. Third, recognise Christ's authority and your identity in him. Fourth, act on God's answer. Five, 
build your life on the solid rock of faith in Jesus. So let's go through those. First of all, come in faith. I don't know how much faith you have to bring before God. But let me tell you, God will work with whatever you have. Don't treat faith as something that earns a response from God. Just bring your faith, however much. Wrap it in the tears of a broken heart and God will deal with that. And he will help your faith to grow. Secondly, come in humility, recognising who he is and who we are. We come with nothing to earn God's grace. So what can we bring to offer? We bring our lives. Our lives that are tarnished by all kinds of stuff. Stuff that has happened to us, stuff that we've done to ourselves and to others. Sin is the word that describes this. In humility, with open hearts, we are to come and lay all of that down before God. The mess, the sins, the pain, the hurts, however caused. Bring it all to God. Lay it at the foot of the cross with open, humble hearts. And then third, recognise Christ's authority. What he says goes. Sitting under Christ's authority means we take his response. We don't try and limit it. We submit to it. And recognising Christ's authority also helps us to be reminded that our identity is as a child of God, not in our pain. That is so important. You are identified by your faith in Jesus not in your pain. And I know people who over the years have carried that pain that it has become their identity. The identity of the abandoned wife or abandoned husband or the identity of someone with a particular illness, whatever it might be. No, your identity is not in your pain. Your identity is in Jesus Christ. Fourth, Act on God's answer. Now that's not easy. Sometimes we do not bring our pain to Jesus because we know what the response will be. The hurt we feel about a betrayal that has gone to the, the very core of our being. Sometimes we don't bring that to Jesus because we know what the response will be. The response is to forgive. But we're to bring it. And then we are to act on God's answer. And we could get different answers from God. It could be not yet. There is something more for you to learn or experience. And as you are being transformed by the pain that you are experiencing. Maybe God's answer has already been given. Maybe you've already received it and not acted upon it. Or maybe... There could be an immediate answer, an immediate healing. Whatever the answer is, act on it. Don't compromise it or blend it with the answer you would have preferred to have had or the answers that you're taking from the world or the answers that you're taking from your own preferences. Accept God's answer and act on it. And then fifth, Build your life on the solid rock of faith in Jesus. This will equip you to withstand the storms and the torrents that come your way. It will equip you to act on God's answer to your pain. And it will give you a hope, a living hope that is the antidote to all the rubbish that this world will throw in your direction. And you will discover that Jesus is greater than any limitations we or other people put on us. Pain is part of life. It is not failure. Being a Christian does not make you immune from it. 
but God will walk with you through it. Sometimes healing or removing it. Sometimes allowing us to learn from it. But always bearing it with us. The most important thing for you to know is with faith, with God in your life, you are never alone. We are children of the living God. Our hope is in him. Let me finish with some words from Matthew's Gospel. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Amen.
Spirit, lead us where our trust is without borders. Let us walk upon the waters wherever you would call us. Take us deeper than our feet could ever wander, and our faith will be made stronger. We are your people, and you are our God. Amen. What a dangerous prayer. Be careful what you wish for. To grow in faith and trust in God more and ourselves less, we need to give up control and that can be a very scary prospect. Thank you to Graham for his words about an extraordinary act of faith from an unlikely person. May they inspire us to grow in faith ourselves. Jesus says in Matthew 17 verse 20 that if we have faith as small as a mustard seed, small as a mustard seed, mustard seeds are very, very small, look. If we have faith as small as a mustard seed, we can move mountains. Imagine what we can do if we let this tiny seed of faith grow. Like many of you, I've been helping my son with his schoolwork during lockdown. And this week we've been planting seeds, haven't we? Yeah? Is it done? Yeah. We've been learning about what they need, watching amazing time-lapse videos of seeds sprouting. Do you remember that one? The seed coming up fast. <laughs> it takes a child's perspective to remember the everyday miracle of a seed bursting into life. This tiny, dried, shriveled up thing, suddenly developing a root and a shoot. <laughs> and watching it starting to grow. So what did we decide we thought seeds might need? Um, well, well, we have some seeds growing mm -hmm. that don't have even light and water. So it was light and water, we thought they were going to need light and water, didn't we? So yes, these ones, hang on, I can't see the box, so let's show them. These ones were in a box with a lid. And and some of them were with water and it's sprouting. <gasps> Look, the ones with water are sprouting. Not very much, they've only been in a couple of days. What about the ones without water, are they sprouting? Nope. Nope. And not even the ones in the sunlight and with water, they're not sprouting. No, they're not, but we've got some other seeds that have been in with light and water that are. So we know ones with light and water do sprout sometimes, don't we? Mm. Yeah, so I hope these will start sprouting tomorrow. So we reckon seeds need light and water. But we did find that right in the beginning, they just need water, don't they? None of the ones with no water sprouted, did they? None of the dry ones sprouted. No. Faith is like a seed. Did you know that? If you water that seed I mean, with... You did. If you water that seed with the living water of God's word, prayer and worship, and you bathe it in its presence. It says in the Bible, you're right. Then it will start to grow. Without that, it can't grow at all. But if you shine the light, community of other believers on it, then it will grow. And without that light, that seed might start to grow, but it will grow small and pale and sickly and misshapen. Oh dear, it's not good, is it? No. In the right conditions, it can grow and blossom and bear fruit for others to enjoy. What's your favourite fruit? Apples? Um, Strawberries? Um, no, I'm not sure what I have one. You don't have one, you like all fruit. Mm. Mm. So the seed of faith will grow and bear fruit for others to enjoy. If you're visiting us today, want to find out more about Christianity, or you want to reconnect with a community of believers, do get in touch using the email address that will be given at the end of the service, respond at openbaptist.org.uk. We'd love to send you one of these free resource packs with a gospel the Word of God to bathe in, sorry, it's gospel. Word of God to bathe in, a little book about God, and some daily readings. We'd love to connect you with our community. 
we'd love to shine the light of fellowship on you and welcome you to join us. If you've been attending OBC for a while and feel that now is the time to step into a life group, please contact us at the same address. As we say goodbye this week, let's recognise that we're all on a faith journey, even if we aren't physically going anywhere at the moment, and we'll finish with a traditional Irish blessing. May the road rise to meet you, and the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rain fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen.